The Detective Stories Washington, May 2, P.M. The police resources of the country have been fairly tested during the past two weeks. Under the circumstances, the shrewdness and energy of both municipal and national detectives have been proven good. The latter body has had a too partial share of the applause thus far, while the great efforts of our New York and other officers have been overlooked. In the crowning success of Doherty, Conger, and Baker on the Virginia side of the water we have forgotten the as vigorous and better sustained pursuit on the Maryland side. Yet the Secretary of War has thanked all concerned, especially referring to many excellent leaders in the long hunt through Charles and St. Mary's counties. Here the military and civil forces together amounted to quite a small army, and constituted by far the largest police organization ever known on this side of the Atlantic. I think the adventures and expedients of these public servants worthy of a column. It would be out of all proportion to pass them by when we devote a dozen lines to every petty larceny and shoplifting. On the Friday night of the murder the departments were absolutely paralyzed. The murderers had three good hours for escape, they had evaded the pursuit of lightning by snapping the telegraph wires, and rumor filled the town with so many reports that the first valuable hours, which should have been used to follow hard after them, were consumed in feverish efforts to know the real extent of the assassination. Immediately afterwards, however, or on Saturday morning early, the provost and special police force got on the scent, and military and squads were dispatched close upon their heels. Three grand pursuits were organized, one reaching up the north bank of the Potomac toward Chain Bridge, to prevent escape by that direction into Virginia, where Mosby, it was suspected, waited to hail the murderers. A second starting from Richmond, Virginia, northward, forming a broad advancing picket or skirmish line between the Blue Ridge and the Broad Sea running streams. A third to scour the peninsula towards Point Lookout. The latter region became the only one well examined, the northern expedition failed until advised from below to capture Atzerodt, and failed to capture Payne. Yet there were cogent probabilities that the assassin had taken this route, far Mosby would have given them the right hand of fellowship. When that gorilla heard of Booth's feet, said Captain Jett, he exclaimed. Now, bye. I could take that man in my arms. Washington, as a precautionary measure, was doubly picketed at once, the authorities in all northern towns advised of the personnel of the murderer, and requests made of the detective chiefs in Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, to forward to Washington without delay their best decoys. A court of inquiry was organized on the moment, and early in the week succeeding rewards were offered. An individual, and not the government, offered the first rewards. There were two men without whom the hunt would have gone astray many times. John S. Young, chief of the New York detective force, a powerful and resolute man, whose great weight and strength are matched by boundless energy, and both subordinate to a head as clear as the keen and searching warrant of his eye. This man has been in familiar converse with every rebel agent in the Canadas, and is feared by them as they fear the fates of Beale and Kennedy. Without being a sensationist, he has probably rendered the cleverest services of the war to the general government. They sent for him immediately after the tragedy, and he stopped on the way for his old police companion, Marshal Murray. The latter's face and figure are familiar to all who know New York, he resembles an admiral on his quarterdeck, he is a detective of fair and excellent repute, and has a somewhat novel pride in what he calls the most beautiful gallows in the United States. These officials were ordered to visit Colonel Ingram's office and examine the little evidence on hand. They and their tried officers formed a junction on Sunday afternoon with the large detective force of Provost Marshal Major Obierney. The latter commands the District of Columbia Civil and Military Police. He is a New Yorker and has been shot through the body in the field. The detective force of Young and Murray consisted of officers Radford. Kelso, Elder, and Hoey, of New York, Deputy Marshal Newcomb, formerly of 
The World City Staff, Officers Joseph Pearson and West, of Baltimore. Major O'Birney's immediate aides were Detectives John Lee, Lloyd, Gavigan, Cottingham, and Williams. A detachment of the Philadelphia Detective Police, Force Officers Taggart, George Smith, and Carlin, reporting to Colonel Baker, went in the direction of the North Pole. Everybody is on the cave eye for them. To the Provost Marshal of Baltimore, MacPhail, who knew the tone and bearing of the country throughout, was joined the zealous cooperation of Officer Lloyd, of Major O'Birney's staff, who had a personal feeling against the secessionists of Lower Maryland, they had once driven him away for his loyalty and had reserved their hospitality for assassins. Lieutenant Commander Gushing, I am informed, also rendered important services to the government in connection with the police operations. Volunteer detectives, such as ex-Marshal Lewis and Angelus, were plentiful. It is probable that in the pitch of the excitement 500 detective officers were in and around Washington City. At the same time the secret police of Richmond abandoned their ordinary business, and devoted themselves solely to this overshadowing offense. No citizen, in these terrible days, knows what eyes were upon him as he talked and walked, nor how his stature and guise were keenly scanned by folks who passed him absent-faced, yet with his mental portrait carefully turned over, the while some invisible hand clutched a revolver, and held a life-or-death challenge upon his lips. The military forces were commanded by Colonel Wells, of the 26th Michigan Regiment, whose activity and zeal were amply sustained by Colonel Clendenning, of the 8th Illinois Cavalry, probably the finest body of horse in the service. The first party to take the South Maryland Road was dispatched by Major O'Birney, and commanded by Lieutenant Lovett, of the Veteran Reserves. It consisted of 25 cavalrymen, with Detectives Cottingham, Lloyd, and Gavigan, these latter, with the lieutenant, kept well in advance. They made inquiries of a soothing and cautious character, but saw nothing suspicious until they arrived at Piscataway, where an unknown man, some distance ahead, observed them and took to the woods. This was on Sunday night, forty hours after the murder. Guided by Officer Lloyd, the little band dashed on, arriving at Bryantown on Tuesday. Here they arrested John Lloyd, of the hotel at Surrettsville, of whom they had previously inquired for the murderers and he had said positively that he neither knew them nor had seen anybody whatever on the night of the crime. He was returning in a wagon, with his wife, whom he had ordered, the day before, to go on a visit to Allen's Fresh, the Monday afterward he started to bring her back. This woman, frightened at the arrest, acknowledged at once that in her husband's conduct there was some inexplicable mystery. He was taciturn and defiant as before, until confronted by some of his old union neighbors. The few Unionists of Prince George's and Charles Counties, long persecuted and intimidated, now came forward and gave important testimony. Among these was one Roby, a very fat and very zealous old gentleman, whose professions were as ample as his perspiration. He told the officers of the secret meetings for conspiracies, sake at Lloyd's Hotel, and although a very John Gilpin on horseback, rode here and there to his great loss of wind and repose, fastening fire coals upon the guilty or suspected. Lloyd was turned over to Mr. Cottingham, who had established a jail at Robytown, that night his house was searched, and Booth's carbine found hidden in the wall. Three days afterward, Lloyd himself confessed, and his neck is quite nervous at this writing. This little party, under the untiring Lovett, examined all the farmhouses below Washington resorting to many shrewd expedients, and taking note of the great swamps to the east of Port Tobacco, they reached Newport at last and fastened tacit guilt upon many residents. Beyond Bryantown they overhauled the residence of Dr. Mudd and found Booth's boot. This was before Lloyd confessed, and was the first positive trace the officers had that they were really close upon the assassins. I do not recall anything more wild and startling than this vague and dangerous exploration of a dimly known, hostile, and ignorant country. To these few detectives we owe much of the subsequent successful prosecution of the pursuit. They were the Hebrew spies. By this time the country was filling up with soldiers, 
but previously a second memorable detective party went out under the personal command of Major O'Birney. It consisted, besides that officer, of Lee, D'Angelia, Callahan, Hoey, Bostwick, Hanover, Bevins, and McHenry, and embarked at Washington on a steam tug for Chappelle's Point. Here a military station had long been established for the prevention of blockade and mail running across the Potomayo. It was commanded by Lieutenant Laverty and garrisoned by 65 men. On Tuesday night, Major O'Birney's party reached this place, and soon afterwards, a telegraph station was established here by an invaluable man to the expedition, Captain Beckwith, General Grant's chief cipher operator, who tapped the point lookout wire and placed the War Department within a moment's reach of the theater of events. Major O'Birney's party started at once over the worst road in the world for Port Tobacco. If any place in the world is utterly given over to depravity, it is Port Tobacco. From this town, by a sinuous creek, there is flatboat navigation to the Potomac, and across that river to Maddox's Creek. Before the war Port Tobacco was the seat of a tobacco aristocracy and a haunt of Negro traders. It passed very naturally into a rebel post for blockade runners and a rebel post office general. Gambling, corner fighting, and shooting matches were its lyceum education. Violence and ignorance had every suffrage in the town. Its people were smugglers, to all intents, and there was neither Bible nor geography to the whole region adjacent. Assassination was never very unpopular at Port Tobacco, and when its victim was a northern president it became quite heroic. A month before the murder a provost marshal nearby was slain in his bedchamber. For such a town and district the detective police were the only effective missionaries. The hotel here is called the Bronner House, it has a bar in the nethermost cellar, and its patrons, carousing in that imperfect light, look like the denizens of some burglar's crib, talking robbery between their cups, its dining room is dark and tumble down, and the cuisine bears traces of Kaffir origin, a barbecue is nothing to a dinner there. The courthouse of Port Tobacco is the most superfluous house in the place, except the church. It stands in the center of the town in a square, and the dwellings lie about it closely, as if to throttle justice. Five hundred people exist in Port Tobacco, life there reminds me, in connection with the slimy river and the adjacent swamps, of the great reptile period of the world, when iguanodons and pterodactyls and pleosauri ate each other. Into this abstract of Gamara the few detectives went like angels who visited Lot. They pretended to be inquiring for friends, or to have business designs, and the first people they heard of were Harold and Atzerat. The latter had visited Port Tobacco three weeks before the murder, and intimated at that time his design of fleeing the country. But everybody denied having seen him subsequent to the crime. Atzerat had been in town just prior to the crime. He had been living with a widow woman named Mrs. Wheeler, by whom he had several children, and she was immediately called upon by Major O'Birney. He did not tell her what Atzerat had done, but vaguely hinted that he had committed some terrible crime, and that since he had done her wrong, she could vindicate both herself and justice by telling his whereabouts. The woman admitted that Atzerat had been her bane, but she loved him and refused to betray him. His trunk was found in her garret, and in it the key to his paint shop and port tobacco. The latter was fruitlessly searched, but the probable whereabouts of Atzerat in Montgomery County obtained, and Major O'Birney telegraphing there immediately, the desperate fellow was found and locked up. A man named Krangle who had succeeded Atzerat in Mrs. Wheeler's pliable affections, was arrested at once and put in jail. A number of disloyal people were indicated or spotted as in no wise angry at the president's taking off, and for all such a provost prison was established. Illustration, Maryland A few miles from Port Tobacco dwelt a solitary woman, who, when questioned, said that for many nights she had heard, after she had retired to bed, a man enter her cellar and lie there all night, departing before dawn. Major O'Birney and the detectives ordered her to place a lamp in her window the next night she heard him enter, and at dark they established a cordon of armed officers around the place. At midnight punctually she exhibited the light, when the officers broke into the house and thoroughly searched it, without result. 
Yet the woman positively asserted that she had heard the man enter. It was afterward found that she was of diseased mind. By this time the military had come up in considerable numbers, and Major. Obirni was enabled to confer with Major Waite, of the 8th Illinois. The Major had pushed on Monday night to Leonardstown, and pretty well overhauled that locality. It was at this time that preparations were made to hunt the swamps around Chapman Town, Beantown, and Allen's Fresh. Booth had been entirely lost since his departure from Mudd's house, and it was believed that he had either pushed on for the Potomac or taken to the swamps. The officers sagaciously determined to follow him to the one and to explore the other. The swamps tributary to the various branches of the Wacomico River, of which the chief feeder is Allen's Creek, bear various names, such as Jordan Swamp, Atchall Swamp, and Scrub Swamp. There are dense growths of dogwood, gum, and beech, planted in sluices of water and bog, and their width varies from a half mile to four miles, while their length is upwards of sixteen miles. Frequent deep ponds dot this wilderness place, with here and there a stretch of dry soil, but no human being inhabits the malarious extent, even a hunted murderer would shrink from hiding there. Serpents and slimy lizards are the only denizens, sometimes the coon takes refuge in this desert from the hounds, and in the soil mud a thousand odorous muskrats delve, with now and then a tremorous otter. But not even the hunted negro dares to fathom the treacherous clay, nor make himself a fellow of the slimy reptiles which reign absolute in this terrible solitude. Here the soldiers prepared to seek for the president's assassin, and no search of the kind has ever been so thorough and patient. The Shawnee, in his stronghold of despair in the heart of Okefewokee, would scarcely have changed homes with Wilkes Booth and David Harold, hiding in this inhuman country. The military forces deputed to pursue the fugitives were 700 men of the 8th Illinois Cavalry, 600 men of the 22nd Colored Troops, and 100 men of the 16th New York. These swept the swamps by detachments, the mass of them dismounted, with cavalry at the belts of clearing, interspersed with detectives at frequent intervals in the rear. They first formed a strong picket cordon entirely around the swamps, and then, drawn up in two orders of battle, advanced boldly into the bogs by two lines of march. One party swept the swamps longitudinally, the other pushed straight across their smallest diameter. A similar march has not been made during the war, the soldiers were only a few paces apart, and in steady order they took the ground as it came, now plunging to their armpits in foul sluices of gangrene water, now hopelessly submerged in slime, now attacked by regions of wood ticks, now tempting some unfaithful log or greenishly solid morass, and plunging to the tip of the skull in poison stagnation, the tree boughs rent their uniforms, they came out upon dry land, many of them without a rag. Of garments scratched, and gashed, and spent, repugnant to themselves, and disgusting to those who saw them, but not one trace of Booth or Harold was anywhere found. Wherever they might be, the swamps did not contain them. While all this was going on, a force started from Point Lookout, and swept the narrow necks of St. Mary's quite up to Medley's Neck. To complete the search in this part of the country, Colonel Wells and Major O'Birney started with a force of cavalry and infantry for Chapel Point, they took the entire peninsula as before, and marched in close skirmish line across it, but without finding anything of note. The matter of enclosing a house was by cavalry advances, which held all the avenues till mounted detectives came up. Many strange and ludicrous adventures occurred on each of these expeditions. While the forces were going up Cobb's Neck, there was a counterforce coming down from Allen's Fresh. Major O'Birney started for Leonardstown with his detective force and played off Laverty as Booth and Hoey as Harold. These two advanced to farmhouses and gave their assumed names, asking at the same time for assistance and shelter. They were generally avoided, except by one man named Claggart, who told them they might hide in the woods behind his house. When Claggart was arrested, However, he stated that he meant to hide them only to give them up. While on this adventure, a man who had heard of the reward came very near shooting Laverty. The ruse now became hazardous and the detectives resumed their real characters. I have not time to go into the detail of this long and excellent hunt.
My letter of yesterday described how the detectives of Mr. Young and Marshall Murray examined the Negro Swan and traced Booth to the house of Sam Cox, the richest rebel in Charles County. There is a gap in the evidence between the arrival of Booth at this place and his crossing the Potomac above Swan Point in a stolen or purposely provided canoe. But as Cox's house is only 10 miles from the river, it is possible that he made the passage of the intermediate country undiscovered. 1. Mills, a rebel mail carrier, also arrested, saw Booth and Harold lurking along the river bank on Friday, he referred Major O'Birney to 1. Claggart, a rebel, as having seen them also, but Claggart held his tongue and went to jail. On Saturday night, Major O'Birney, thus assured, also crossed the Potomac with his detectives to Boone's farm, where the fugitives had landed. While collecting information here a gunboat swung up the stream and threatened to fire on the party. It was now night, and all the party worn to the ground with long travel and want of sleep. Lieutenant Laverty's men went a short distance down the country and gave up, but Major O'Birney, with a single man, pushed all night to King George's courthouse, and next day, Sunday, re-embarked for Chappelle's Point. Hence he telegraphed his information, and asked permission to pursue, promising to catch the assassins before they reached Port Royal. This the department refused. Colonel Baker's men were delegated to make the pursuit with the able Lieutenant Doherty, and O'Birney, who was the most active and successful spirit in the chase, returned to Washington, cheerful and contented. At Mrs. Burritt's Washington house, at the Pennsylvania Hotel, Washington, and at Surrettsville, the booth plot was almost entirely arranged. These three places will be relics of conspiracy forever. Harold said to Lieutenant Doherty, after the latter had dragged him from the barn. Who's that man in there? It can't be Booth, he told me his name was. Lloyd. He further said that he had begged food for Booth from house to house while the latter hid in the woods. The Confederate captain, Willie Jett, who had given Booth a lift behind. His saddle from Port Royal to Garrett's farm was then courting a miss. Goldman at Bowling Green, his traveling companions were lieutenants. Ruggles and Burbridge Payne, the assassin of the Seward's, was arrested by officers Samson of the Sub-Treasury and DeVoe, acting under General Alcott. The latter had besides, officers Marsh and Clancy, a stenographer. The reward for the capture of Booth will be distributed between very many men. The Negro, Swan, will get as much of it as he deserves. It amounts to about $80,000, but the War Department may increase it at discretion. The entire rewards amount to 160 odd thousand. Major O'Birney should get a large part of it as well. This story, which I must close abruptly, deserves to be rewritten with all its accessory endeavors. What I have said is in skeleton merely and far from exhaustive.